Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me here and offering me the opportunity to share with you some thoughts and thanks for the introduction and thanks Ellie for a fantastic uh, opening session. We only met a, an hour ago so I think there are quite a few overlaps here so we'll, we'll try and explore some of them as we go along. So in this talk I want to make the argument that if we put uncertainty at the centre of thinking and practice, this means actually a really fundamental rethinking of the way we think about and do development. Uh, a real challenge to development as we know it. And I want to show that for a variety of reasons we're still stuck in the type of linear, mechanistic, technocratic mode that Ellie talked about in the context of forestry in Tanzania, but elsewhere, sometimes with extras added on, but very often not, that fails to address the dynamic complexity and uncertainty of today's turbulent world. And I want to argue that this is not only problematic, but actually can be quite dangerous. So through the talk I want to share a number of different examples, quite diverse examples, to sort of provoke you. Uh, but in particular I want to make the case that taking seriously those who live with and live from uncertainty is absolutely key. And I want to illustrate this through some work on pastoralism that myself and colleagues are engaged in across the world. Now as Christian said, we're here celebrating uh, the life and work of Esther Bozrup, and I'm absolutely delighted to be associated with her work through uh, uh, receiving this, this prize. And she, of course, through all of these works, understood dynamism and complexity in local settings really, really well. She also, of course, challenged conventional wisdoms, um, as Christian mentioned, uh, challenging perspect Neo-Malthusian perspectives on population, uh, bringing issues such as women's roles in development into the frame and thinking about technological in innovation. And I hope this talk in different ways enters into the spirit of, of challenge, uncovering new ways of thinking uh, that can help transform uh, our thinking about development as Esther Bozrup did so effectively. So, as I said, my focus is on uncertainty as a concept and as a practice. Uh, uncertainty as the unpredictable unknowns that confront us on a day-to-day -day basis. Helga Novotny in her book The Cunning of Uncertainty argued that uh, such uncertainties are in a way written into the script of life. So whether this is in respect of climate change, whether it's in respect of finance systems or critical infrastructures or migration flows or epidemic disease outbreaks, uncertainties continuously, continuously undermine the neat, simple ways policies and institutions are designed. So it's not just in forestry, it's across, across the board. So what do I mean by uncertainty? or more broadly, drawing on the work of my colleague at Sussex, Andy Sterling, the more encompassing term, incertitude. This is a diagram that he has used and I've used um, that identifies four different dimensions. And I want to illustrate the four different dimensions of incertitude with a case from a pastoral area in northern Kenya, in this case Isiolo. So first there's risk where the probabilities of both outcomes and their likelihoods are, are known or at least deemed unproblematic. Unpro so if we're building a road, for example, engineers might be able to assess uh, according to reasonably well-framed engineering uh, probabilities. But then risk is contrasted with uncertainty, where the likelihoods really aren't known. So, for example, take drought. Despite all the improvements in climate forecasting, early warning systems, in the end, in dry areas, we just don't know whether a drought's going to happen or not. It's uncertain. We don't know the likelihoods. Even less talked about, though, are scenarios or cases where outcomes are contested. 
We might know the probabilities or the likelihoods of them happening, but we don't, there are multiple p potential outcomes. So take again from Isiolo. This area, an area of land could be used for livestock production, camels in this case, or it could be used for wildlife and tourism, or it could be, in this case, Isiolo's so-called international airport, used for inf infrastructure development. Different types of outcomes all being contested. Here, of course, questions of fairness, of justice, of distribution, who wins, who loses, whose values count, come to the fore. And finally, we have the condition which we can call ignorance, where in the words of uh, former US Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, there are unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know, we don't know. And as he knew all too well, you're extremely exposed when things are this indeterminate. Indeed, expanding knowledge, especially when uh, things are incommensurable, may actually only increase ignorance, where we really don't know what we don't know. So I would argue that the three conditions outside risk are probably the most common conditions we face in development, in the day-to-day -day lives of development. And they are not amenable to simple managerial risk management. Other dimensions of incertitude are important. But why is it that we end up with focusing only on risk and risk management. Institutions, practices, conditioned by politics, power, governmentality, habitus indeed, um, tend to close down towards risk. So we have a variety of things. Ellie talked about some of them in his, his talk. Plans, models, insurance products, goals, metrics, indicators. The cases on this slide are associated with pastoral settings, but you could transfer them to any other. They all push us dangerously towards zones where knowledge and outcomes are assumed to be known or at least thought to be able to be estimated. So let me give you a quick example. There's much excitement these days in pastoral areas about technology-led approaches to climate adaptation. Mobile phones with climate predictions on them, insurance products that link to index-based payouts and so on. And by definition, these assess outcomes in terms of predicted probabilities based on climate models and liability assessments and so on. Now, it would be fine if those predictions were accurate, but inevitably, just inevitably, they're not because of complexity and uncertainty. So relying on these, and often a removed market-based solution, some argue, actually increases vulnerability and undermines local responses uh, of those who are more attuned to uncertainty. So, where do all these professional practices, institutional styles in development that push us in this way towards this sort of technical managerialist approach come from? I think those of us involved in development need to dig a bit deeper into histories of development and how they're framed, framed through uh, a longer term history. Very often, people start the history of development with Harry Truman's speech uh, in, in 1945. The idea that development was this big, normative aspiration for change after World War II. This, of course, morphed into what became the Washington Consensus, where this big, normative, modernist project was now going to be delivered by markets rather than states. But it was a very particular framing of what development was. Now this book is one that I keep turning to. It was written a long time ago, Doctrines of Development by Cowan and Shenton, and they, they offer a much deeper and longer history of debates and, and underlying philosophies of development. And I think it's quite useful to think back. They make the argument that as in the early 1800s in Western ideas of development, the likes of Auguste Comte, for example, 
had a perspective on development, not called it in the same way as Harry Truman defined it, but the idea of progress and change and, and, and modernity, rooted in understandings of cycles, of change, of growth, of destruction, uncertainty, in other words. And it was only later, during the later 1800s, early 1900s, with the growth of the Industrial Revolution in Europe and beyond, and Darwinian ideas of evolution as progress, that a new type of modernity was being constructed. And of course this was replicated in all sorts of, uh, of arguments. Rostow's stages of economic growth, for example, is, is one example, where a sort of evolutionist idea that we were on a linear line to modernist progress was, was, was pushed. The result, of course, of this in practical terms is that we end up with development as blueprint plans, as control, as modernization. But actually, it needn't be that way. We can think of alternative inspirations, not only from Western philosophies, but as Ellie mentioned, from others too. And of course, uncertainty as a core concept is not alien to some of the core disciplines that are associated with development, whether in, in scientific disciplines or economics or whatever. I'm not going to go through these quotes, but they're from very well-established, famous people who've won Nobel Prizes and are very well respected in their fields, of course. But that idea that uncertainty is central to our understanding of science or economics has often been lost in the move towards a more technocratic planning vision of development that took place particularly from the 1960s onwards. Disciplines narrowed down, perspectives where uncertainty uh, was one, were once central have been lost. And this occurs in research, and it also occurs especially in teaching. Uh, look at any standard textbook you like um, at, in any of these disciplines and notions of uncertainty are often barely mentioned if at all. And this I think is a problem because we've lost some of those intellectual traditions. And it's a real problem because uncertain conditions and the failure of policies and institutions to address such conditions is a big problem for development and the global challenges we face. And it's often one of the main reasons why development too often fails. So across fields there's a beginning of a realization that this now really matters and I want to focus on that with three quick examples of where a framing that has excluded uncertainty is being challenged by others that uh, open up perspectives on uncertainty. And these are going to be quite diverse examples so bear with me. First is finance and banking. The 2008 financial crash has pro provoked, I think, some really important reflections, including some in those books on the right-hand side of the, the slide there, um, about why that crash happened. The chief economist of the Bank of England, Andy Haldane, has reflected on why the conventional approach characterized in that middle column on the slide, um, uh, reflected on why that conventional approach, uh, including voluntary regulation, individualized accountability and so on, really just didn't work. In a really interesting paper called Rethinking the Financial Network, he argued that processes of securitization of derivative markets resulted in the network becoming more complex, more dense, more opaque, with diversification generating heightened, what he called, system-wide uncertainty. The result, of course, was the crash of 2008. And this, he argues, was rooted in an exaggerated sense of knowledge and control. He and others argue that new forms of regulation are required that increase transparency, collective accountability, and focuses actually on the cultures and practices of key actors. Markets, after all, and banking and finance systems, as we know, are constructed through social relations. And these really matter, even when transactions are occurring in nanoseconds across globally connected computer networks. 
Let me give you another example emerging from work on critical infrastructures, think energy supply systems, nuclear power stations, air traffic control operations and so on. And again we see two quite contrasting approaches to uncertainty. One, control orientated, engineering based, very much based on a technical managerial approach to risk, remember that diagram at the top left hand corner, this is a standard mainstream approach. The second is what Emery Rowe and colleagues call a mess and reliability approach based on their work on energy systems in California. This is very different. They observe professionals working in such systems where failure is simply unacceptable, where reliability is generated through proactive intervention, tracking between micro practices and broader patterns, and navigating actively away from zones of ignorance and danger. So-called reliability professionals are these scientists, engineers, IT professionals, suppliers, regulators and so on who keep the system running. But many of these responses are informal, below the radar. They use tacit experiential knowledge, case studies, scenarios, pattern recognition skills. And it's this sort of professionalism, not the control-based engineering that makes the system reliable, they argue. So recognizing reliability professionals and indeed training and supporting those, those practices is, they suggest, crucial. My third case is around addressing epidemic disease outbreaks. And again, two stylized somewhat contrasting perspectives on what to do in the face of accelerating uncertainties. The conventional approach, yet again, focused on risk management, predictive models, early warning systems, leading often to quite a medicalized, securitized approach. These technocratic, some call them post-political responses, center on risk management techniques and those, that whole array of expert-led practices associated with early warning, emergency preparedness, contingency planning, they're all justified by a depoliticized crisis narrative which obscures complexities and uncertainties. Yet, when we think about the experience of Ebola in West Africa and in that, now indeed in Central Africa or avian influenza before in Southeast Asia, such top-down risk management approaches just simply don't work. They don't deal with the uncertainties at play and the social relations, cultural logics, community interactions at the center of disease outbreak. And Paul Richards, in, in one of those books on the left-hand side, argues that it's actually common sense, improvisation, distributed practical knowledge and collective action that are the invaluable elements of what he calls a people science of infection control, based on his experience of Ebola in Sierra Leone. And it's one of these, these responses that are really located in real-time responses to uncertainty, moving away from those managerial approaches. So these three cases, and I could add many, many more, and I'm sure you could too, are showing the limits of a risk-based control-orientated approach. But more importantly, the critique is easy, but what are they also showing um, is that un if uncertainty is also being is being addressed, there are alternatives there, whether that's around the regulation of market networks, the role of reliability and mess managers, or the importance of cultural logics and distributed collective responses. And I think this emergent rethinking is important because it resonates across so many areas. But where can we also learn about how to do things better, how to respond to uncertainty in new ways? And I argue that particularly those who have lived with, from, off uncertainty for millennia are probably very good teachers on this. So you are asking, well, what earth is he on about, about trying to link financial derivatives, air traffic control, hurricanes, global disease outbreak, and in this case, camels in northern Kenya. I think there are some important connections because it is at the 
uh, at the front line of managing and responding to uncertainty where we're beginning to understand alternatives to this managerial approach. So in discussions last year in Isiolo in Kenya um, it, amongst a group of elders, one of them just commented at the end of a long and fascinating discussion of, of how uncertainty is understood. Uncertainties are here, are here now, he said. That's our life. In a way, the idea that uncertainty is imbricated in the day-to-day -day and the everyday is important. So making connections between pastoralist understanding of live and lived experience and other domains is central to a project that uh, I'm lucky enough to lead, funded by the European Research Council, called Pastres. And it's these connections that we're working on uh, at the moment. And I want to share a little bit of some of the early thinking from that project with you. The project's working in quite a number of different places around the world, working with pastoralists in, in Amdo, Tibet, in China, in Western India, in Southern Ethiopia, in Isiolo in Kenya, in Southern Tunisia, and in Sardinia in Italy. Um, with the fieldwork being led by PhD students all from those areas, with the exception of one, and looking at uncertainties associated with environment, with markets, with governance, and particularly the interactions between them. It's really interesting, and I want to give you now three very short examples of the sort of things that we're exploring, which link back to the bigger themes that I was mentioning before. All of them, I think, adding to an argument that we have to rethink development if, we're to embrace, if we embrace uncertainty effectively. So first, our work in Sardinia um, is raising, I think, really important questions about the construction of market networks and how socially and culturally embedded economic behaviour can, can affect exposure to market volatility just as it was with the case of post-crash finance and banking systems uh, that I mentioned before. Now this is a big issue in Sardinia when, where most sheep milk is linked to industrial production of pecorino cheese, which is exported, and where prices of milk and fodder fluctuate wildly over time. So by looking at different types of market network, and indeed the social, cultural, political relations at their heart, some more linear and exposed to globalized forces, some more diversified and embedded in local economies, we can begin to explore how economic development, markets and uncertainties are interconnected. So responding to uncertainty requires, we believe, a much more sophisticated approach to market development than just thinking about demand and supply and price setting and value chains and so on and pushes us to think more broadly about the nature of those networks and how they're constructed. The second theme is, uh, is, relates to our work in Kenya and indeed actually across all the sites, focuses on the importance of mob mobility as a flexible response to uncertainty. So of course this has been long recognized in studies of pastoral systems, nomadic and transhumant, but the principles of mobility are being applied in new ways as pastoralism in all these sites is transformed by changing political economies and ecologies. So fodder rather than animals may be moved. Herds may be split in new ways. Different combinations of large and small stock, young and old stock may be moved in different ways. And new relationships are brokered with sedentary populations, both urban and rural. All of this is facilitated by new technologies, mobile phones, transport and so on. So in pastoral systems now, mobility takes on many forms. It's not an archaic form of nomadism, but its mobility is absolutely central to their livelihoods. And of course, mobility is increasingly central <coughs> and is central to people in a globalized world. Yet, despite this, we still have institutional and policy restrictions, border controls, migrant status, and so on and so forth, that restricts the ability to move and to, to move flexibly in order to respond to uncertainties. And these diverse practices and strategies of mobility are so central to livelihoods these days, I think pastoralists in particular could teach us a thing or two. So thirdly, 
relating to our work in, in Amdo, Tibet, in China, we're looking at how hybrid institutions around land and grazing management um, are evolving uh, in those settings in response to a variety of forms of uncertainty, very much drawing on Christian's work actually in this, in this theme. Drawing on the type of practical experiential knowledge, improvisation and experiment, that ability to adapt and respond to uncertainties and manage land and grazing is absolutely key, particularly as resources become constrained. But what evolves are not standard designs, either communal, old-style communal tenure systems or individualized private systems, no matter what the state policy is. They're much more complex, much more hybrid, much more specific. So reliability, just as with the critical infrastructures, energy supply systems and so on, is developed through these type of social networks where investing in relations, in institutions, is vital. Shared knowledge of system change and policy, as well as immediate conditions, is absolutely essential for managing grazing in these harsh, difficult environments. So practical, distributed, embedded knowledges linked to plural institutions allows pastoralists to respond to new uncertainties, of which there are many. Climate, markets, imposition of the, impositions of the Chinese state, so just as with the control operators in the energy supply systems in California, we can learn a lot from pastoral thinking and practicing practices focusing on embracing uncertainty and creating new forms of institutions. So I hope by now I've convinced you that there are some interesting ideas out there which are challenging uh, as it were, mainstream perspectives on a, on a particular version of progress and modernity. And these come from finance and banking, from crit critical infrastructures, from disease control and, and pastoralism, of course. They all suggest quite different approaches and avenues for development. If uncertainty is central, risk-based, control-orientated, managerial, post-political approaches, call them what you will, just simply don't work. A linear vision of modernity and progress is challenged. So taking uncertainty seriously in the way that pastoralists must, as must trading floor bankers, control room reliability professionals, frontline village health workers, means rethinking the way we go about development, quite fundamentally. But I think what's interesting by scanning across such a diverse area is that there are some commonalities emergent out of all of these. Um, and we're already getting a hint at what the type of alternatives might be. So some of the watchwords might be flexibility, mobility, network, sharing, mutuality, improvisation, experiment, practical knowledge, transparency. I could go on. Now, of course, Many of those ideas and terms have been critiqued, been part and parcel of critiques of development for the last 40 or 50 years. Many, many critiques of, of development exist. I've chosen a few books here that have, have come out over the last 40 odd years, including some former uh, uh, winners of this very prize, I think. But all arguing from different standpoints one, that uncertainty is Im important. They may call it contingency, conjuncture, adaptive change, and also that there are a variety of biases that emerge from an from a anti- or post-political techno-modernist vision of development and progress. And together that, those sets of perspectives add up to a challenge to what we in the STEP Centre call controlling transitions. So on the left-hand side of this, uh, of this slide, we see a number of features which, of which you will be familiar from the critique that I've already developed of how a, a risk-based managerial approach um, uh, results in a particular style of control. Managed, expert-led, top-down, particular version of modernist progress, controllable risk, not unpredictable uncertainty. 
rooted in a way to a, a, a sort of technocratic form of, uh, of neoliberalism. That's what development has been since the 1940s and 50s, and particularly since the 1960s. That's, in a way, mainstream development. Incremental shifts in order to result, in order to achieve um, tr uh, incremental transitions. This is contrasted in this table with a perspective that in the Step Centre, which I help coordinate at Sussex, we call caring transformation. Here, uncertainty, uncertainties about the knowledge relations and politics of change uh, is central. It's more political, it's more contested, it's more unruly, and results in a more an emancipatory politics uh, involving multiple um, plural knowledges and skills, where diversity, flexibility, experiment, improvisation are central. These are the type of emergent features that I've highlighted across all my cases. But as we've seen, controlling transitions, the mainstream approach, is rooted in what Nancy Fraser has called progressive neoliberalism, and it's often being challenged and undermined by different types of uncertainties today. I think the edifice on which development was built since the 1940s and 50s is being challenged fairly fundamentally, whether that's by climate collapse, by rising austerity and the failure of neoliberalism to deliver economic uh, benefits, by accelerating economic inequalities, by mass migration, I could go on. But that basic understanding of what development is and what, it, what it's for and what we're aiming to achieve incrementally um, is being challenged quite, quite significantly. But when things get challenged, when there is a, a confrontation with the mainstream, more uncertainties are released. And those uncertainties create anxieties, they create discomfort, they create sometimes fear. And I think we're at that critical moment today where the old order, if you like, is being challenged on so many fronts, unable to deal with these big global challenges, certainly these big, unable to deal with these big global challenges on an incremental transition control-based approach, that we're opening the debate up to alternatives. But the alternatives may end up as caring transformations, but not necessarily. This is an open debate. When things open up, other things may enter the mainstream. And when the mainstream is threatened, um, then there may be other alternatives that emerge. And what we've, we, we've seen, obviously, around the world, perhaps not so much in Denmark, but el elsewhere, is a search for stability and sense of security in the face of uncertainty and turbulence results in the emergence of very often regressive, nationalistic, populist versions of politics, reinforcing control through fear very often. Certainly where I come from in the UK, this is a central current of contemporary politics and could get worse very soon. So if that's entering this space created by the challenges to conventional development in different parts of the world, how do we think about alternatives and construct alternatives in a new way? So I think one of the big challenges is to think about and make the argument for and create the, the practices on the ground for the alternatives that counter this, that are not dominated by, by fear and force, that are more hopeful vision, where principles of care and conviviality and collectivity and commoning are right at the fore. And this creates, in a way, uh, an opportunity for a more emancipatory alternative that counters the controlling transition. Uh, frame. But it's not easy, and it's not obvious how it happens, and very often it's a challenge in order to create it. 
but it does require us to focus on the politics of uncertainty. So all of the examples I've given have raised questions about what is the politics of uncertainty, and it means, I think, moving from uh, a framing of control to care, a, meaning, a, a moving from fear to hope, a mo moving from what one could call a neoliberal post-political risk management approach to one that is focused on uncertainty and emancipatory politics. And I think that's uh, more or less where I want to end, because as we embrace uncertainty, not wishing it away, not ignoring it, not trying to corral it through technical means into places that it shouldn't be, I'd argue this requires actually a very different way of thinking and doing development, more humble, more hopeful, and in a way challenging those old ideas and maybe regenerating even older ideas of what we mean by progress and modernity, in other words, what we mean by development. Very different implications for what we mean by innovation, sustainability and development itself. And I think these are quite profound moments. And I want to end here with a short quote from the writer Rebecca Solnit from her really wonderful book called Hope in the Dark, where she argues, hope locates itself in the premises that we don't know what will happen and that in the spaciousness of uncertainty is room to act. When you recognize uncertainty, you recognize that you may be able to influence the outcomes, you alone or you in concert with a few dozen or several million others. Hope is an embrace of the unknown and unknowable, an alternative to the certainty of both optimists and pessimists. In other words, embracing uncertainty is vital for galvanizing action and vital for development and for a more hopeful, positive future. And I think, hopefully, also, Esther Bozrup would have approved. Thank you. We're going to take a few questions uh, for the two speakers, and then you can approach them bilaterally outside in the lobby after, if you can get your question through now. But we have time to raise a few questions. To have, uh, uh, two, two important questions there, um, uh, which in a way require a lot larger responses than I can give. My argument about risk versus uncertainty was not to say one was better than the other, but, one, but simply to just to say that most of the conditions that we deal with out there are actually, in the, in the classic definitions that I tried to elaborate, are the most common. And if we ignore that um, and assume that things are, can be managed according to a risk framework, we can uh, make big mistakes. So it's not to say that if we're building a bridge we don't use standard, I don't know, risk, risk assessment procedures. That's absolutely fine because they, those are amenable to uh, probabilistic assessments of the likelihoods of failure. But most conditions in broader development sit in those other three areas of ambiguity, ignorance and uncertainty, which means we just need a different way of, of doing things. So by all means, when climate modelling increases its capacity to produce very accurate downscaled assessments of the likelihood of a drought happening or not in a particular place, then by all means we can use risk assessment. But we're not there yet, and actually it's probably quite unlikely that we will be there uh, very soon. So it's not to make a, a, a judgment on, on whether risk is better or whether we should, try, should avoid the uh, challenge of moving from things that are uncertainty by increasing our knowledge about the dynamics of systems, but just to say, actually, out there, things are, by and large, uncertain or in those domains of uncertainty, ambiguity and ignorance. And that 
the argument goes, as I tried to show, comes with some quite profound implications because if we assume we're just in that top left hand corner we can make all sorts of mistakes just as they did in the banking systems just as they can do in critical infrastructure um, and just as development projects do again and again and again in foisting solutions that are framed by a risk uh, management approach uh, on situations that are actually uncertain so the, it links to the argument about how people cope and how people respond to those, dynamic, those complex dynamics of uncertainty. I don't want to reify the ability of, of, of local uh, capacities to cope and respond. Um, there, are certain, there are certain things, of course, that people, people just can't respond to because the, the forms of accelerating uncertainties and combinations of... Uh, of challenges are so great. But I think the example that I gave around uh, pastoral mobility is an interesting one because it's absolutely true that pastoralists don't exist as Evan Pritchard or whoever found them in the 1930s. Um, the classic systems of, of, of old, um, old forms of, of nomadism and transhumans uh, often just don't exist in these settings. But what I think that pastoralists do, just as control room operators and just as do uh, you know, people who operate on the, the uh, banking system floor, people are having to, to think on their feet about how to respond to these new uncertainties. So mobility, although it looks very different um, in Tibet there, where, where I was talking about animals, animals do move up and down the mountains, but also people are bringing in fodder from different places. It's the principles of mobility that are sustained, the principle basic understanding of what mobility means in order to allow a flexible response. So different things move, or mobility is constructed in different ways, or it's assisted actually by technologies that allow mobilities to happen in new ways. So I think it's actually that, those, those principles that become more important rather than saying, oh, we've lost the old style of pastoralism, which we haven't in every place, but often have, but actually learning from people how they're going to adapt, because hell, we are, even in Copenhagen, even in London, we are going to have to adapt to uh, forthcoming uncertainties of the sorts that I've been discussing, whether it's climate, whether it's disease outbreaks, whether it's, uh, where it's whatever. Um, and I think our systems, institutions, policies, practices, professional practices are just not up to it yet, which is why I'm arguing for a, for a substantial change uh, in the way we think and do development, which actually relates very much to, to Ellie's argument about forestry, you know, the idea that every tree exists with a particular, um, what do they call it, DBH, diameter at breast height. <laughs> You know, I love the idea of the unruly miombo. I mean, you know, ecologies are unruly just as our complex system. So the idea that we can regiment forests in that sort of way and think through scientific forestry that we're going to manage them in that way, it's exactly the same argument that you offered, uh, that I was offering, which does require think, rethinking curricula as well as rethinking our professional practices. Because, as I mentioned, I always, one, of the thing, one of my little hobbies is to look whether uh, people have uncertainty in the indices of their books, and particularly textbooks, and you, you'll see them virtually absent, despite the fact that this long lineage of debate about uncertainty. Sorry, that was a rather long question, but they were good questions. Long answer, good questions. Yes. I have to speak something. You said professional practices are something that needs to change. Does that also go for research centers and universities? And, and are you at steps also taking steps to, to change and in what way as to nurture these carrying transformations? Okay, good. Well, there's a, there's a leading question for me to go and advertise the step center. But no, I mean, professional practices includes all of the as it were, mainstream institutions, as it were, create, new, create the habitus, if you like, of, of professionals. And uh, universities are often the last to change. Um, I think 
the examples I gave where change can be seen and exciting innovations happen are often on, on the front line where people are having to adapt. So a professional forester, I mean you gave this example, a nice example, um, a professional forester uh, working in the Miombo woodlands in southern Tanzania is not going to use that type of scientific forestry training. It's just not applicable. So actually those who are on the front line are often having to adapt and change. Just as village health workers dealing with Ebola, just as with uh, control room operators dealing with energy supply systems, just as with um, pastoralists uh, managing variable fodder. Uh, do, uh, which becomes more variable due to climate change. So it's actually that sort of practice-based um, innovation and improvisation that w is where a lot of the innovation, I think, is coming from. Making the universities catch up is, to some extent, or the training centres or the, the diploma courses, is almost the biggest challenge. So in what we've been trying to do in the STEP Centre, we've run, we just ran in May our ninth or eighth or ninth so-called summer school for uh, people doing PhDs or had, who have just finished PhDs working on environment development interactions. And we get people from all over the world, 40 or 40 odd people each year, all over the world who are who are moving through a PhD into professional settings, often into university teaching. And this summer school is very much geared at getting people to think about these sort of arguments in their own intellectual and professional practice. And it's often quite challenging. People are often in a particular department which has a particular disciplinary regime um, and they are having to produce a thesis according to a, a bounded set of ideas that are, the, that are restricted. So we create this space and it is a fairly unruly space in the sense that people are able to think laterally and explore uh, these questions and I think the cadre of people who have been through that summer school are beginning, and I, you know, we're not the only ones who are doing this sort of thing, but are beginning to make waves because I think there's a set of professionals out there working on the interfaces of disciplines and around these sort of global challenges where this type of cross-disciplinary thinking that allows us to think laterally about politics, uncertainty, knowledge and so on in ways that go beyond disciplinary bounds is enormously helpful. Uh, we're lucky at the SEP Centre in that we sit in the interstices of different departments, none of which have a particular disciplinary mission. And I think, frankly, escaping your discipline, as I did many, many years ago, um, as Bev knows, I was a biologist once, an expert on tortoises in Zimbabwe, but anyway, that's another history. Um, uh, escaping those disciplinary confines can be enormously important. Bringing those disciplinary forms of expertise to that, I mean, you, you, know, you still need to know about trees to be a forester, but just as you argued, to expand that scope uh, is vitally important. And I think we are just a long way away from it. And partly the universities, and I don't know whether this is the case in Denmark, but I suspect it is the case, it's certainly the case in the UK, are disciplined themselves by metrics and, and forms of assessment that push people into a particular mode of thinking and doing. And I think it's very, very constraining and it's actually not meeting the challenges. We have this bizarre situation in the UK at the moment where we have loads of money coming out, out around uh, research on global challenges and interdisciplinary working yet the capacities of universities to be able to respond to that uh, remains limited. So I think, yes, we've got a long way to go. All right, now I want to push you, what you're doing and where you're going, to the lobby. We're done for, for now. It's time for some flowers and some certificates flowers. for the recipients. Let's give them a hand and then there's some refreshments on. Thank you.